Welcome everybody, welcome to my talk. Uh, hopefully soon we will get the big screen. Uh, GraphQL versus traditional REST API. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for choosing this talk. I know there's a lot of great talks happening at this moment, you know, at the DevOps Ukraine, you know. It, it's ridiculous, like this time slot is like, you know, all, all rock stars, basically, like, you know. I'm humbled to be, you know, at the same time with them and that actually somebody came to see my talk. So, like, thank you very much for that one. First of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vladimir Dejanovic. This is my Twitter, mail, blog, GitHub, if you want to contact me online. I'm part of IT scene since 2006. In other words, I'm getting paid for the work I do since 2006. And during the years, I did, I did development in all kinds of programming languages, all kinds of frameworks. I worked on all kinds of projects in all kinds of methodologies. Basically, you name it, I did it. I'm a founder and leader of Amsterdam Java User Group. Beside that, I'm giving talks at conferences, of course, and, you know, since recently, I'm Draw One Rockstar. Well, basically, it should be like Draw One Rockstar because one of my talks on the Java One, last Java One, got, like, highest rating, but because they killed Java One and they renamed it to Oracle Code One, they said, okay, you're Oracle Code One star, so go figure. But enough about me. What this talk is going to be about. First, we will look at REST and more precisely what we mean when we say REST and traditional REST APIs. After that, we will spend some time on GraphQL, what the GraphQL is. And then majority of the talk is going to be basically comparison between the REST and the GraphQL. And actually see, okay, like what's the differences, what are similarities, you know, things like that. If you have any questions, please wait until the end. Uh, yeah, time to start. Uh, we have a lot of time, so there's go definitely going to be time for you to ask questions. And again, like if you don't ma manage to ask the question, you can always ask me you know, afterwards. I'm staying here until the end of the conference, or you can always ping me online. I'll be more than happy to answer any question that you want. So let me start with a simple question. What is REST? And you know, you m this might sound like a silly question, right? Because w I assume that we're all developers, right? Every developer here? Yeah, every developer. So I assume that we all build REST every single day, and we know what REST is, right? But the funny thing is, if I really ask this question, we would get a lot of different answers, and unfortunately, a lot of them would be wrong. And the reason for that is that REST has a formal definition, since it was part of doctor dissertation by Roy Fielding in 2000. If you want to read the whole doctor dissertation, this is the URL. It's a very good read, but it's also a very big one. So it's like, you know, it's doctor dissertation. Uh, there needs to be a lot of words in it. So we don't have a time for it full, so let's go look at it in, the, in a more compact way. So what is REST? Client-server architecture. There is a client and there is a server. Separation of concerns. Statelessness. Server has no context or no knowledge about the client. Everything the server needs to respond to the client request, client needs to send in request to the server. <coughs> Cacheability. Server has an option to actually say, okay, for every re response, it should be cached or not and for how long, and everybody should basically behave in that way. Layered system. Client has no clue if it's talking directly to the server or it goes through the multiple layers before it actually reaches the server. For example, like proxies, you know, gateways, firewalls, all those kind of things. Code on demand, well, this is optional. Actually, it means that server can send executable code to the client and in that way basically temporarily extend the client. To be honest with you, I never saw this in practice. And last but not the least, uniform interface which actually, it's a big part of REST and actually says that, you know, different parts of system can evolve independently. So, this is REST in theory, right? But, you know, like most of us, we don't, you know, deal in theory and I know that most of my clients don't really care about the theories and doctor dissertations. They care about APIs that actually deliver some business value and actually add some value to the business, right? And assume it's the same thing for you. So, what's REST in real life? Well, usually it means that we have some data source, most commonly database, and then we have like our application, which actually talks to the database, that gets the data and exposes the data from that database over the API. And of course, we have a client which actually consumes the data. Sometimes the API just go to the database, fetches the data and expose it as it is, without any changes to it. It's so-called crude REST API. There are of course more complex situations where actually we have some business logic, we do some stuff with it and we just don't expose it. But the crude REST APIs are so common, and are like, are so, so often in, in real life that you know people very often forget that rest is much more so let's look at some real life exa real life example let's let's assume we are building a blog and in this blog we have of course a table author and it has id and a name 
then we have a post, right? We can post stuff. Uh, there is ID, title of a post, body of a post, author ID. And then there's, we can also put comments on it. So it's like a you know, very like fancy blog. And every comment, of course, has an ID, text of a comment, ID of the post to each to which it belongs to, and of course, ID of the author who created it. So let's look at the code. Uh, by the way, I'm going to use this URL throughout the code. I'm just going to use different branches. So if I just go, I'm the right one, yes. If I just start this one, and is this big enough, right? Okay, so basically here, I have a table author, and as you can see, it's not really fancy. It's like very simple poetry, right? Basically, I have an ID of a type string. I have a name of a type string. Uh, you can actually see here something which you might know or might not know. Uh, this is basically Lombok, and it's uh, one ni very nice library which actually is going to say, okay, when I just say get me data, it means generate getters, setters, and all the boilerplate code for me. I'm very lazy, so I like to use it. Because I'm using MongoDB as a backend, again, I'm lazy. I just need to add this annotation and say, okay, like, you know, this Pojo, it needs to be mapped to the document called author. So if we go open author repository, again, you will not see nothing fancy here. So we have author repository, right? Again, it extends Mongo repository from the Spring Guys. Again, I'm very lazy, so they did all the work for me. I say, okay, my entity is author. ID is a string. So if I open post, again, you will see it's exactly the same like a table, right, that I showed to you. So we have ID of a type string, author ID of a type string, title of a type string, body of a type string, again, using Lombok data and Spring uh, and basically MongoDB basic annotation for document. And if we open post repository, again, almost not no code here. So post repository, extends Mongo repository for entity post and ID string. So basically like only thing that I did is actually I just mapped you know my tables in the Pojos and the Spring did all the rest work for me. And if we go to, to our controller, you're also going to see that you know that's continuous almost cons also. So I just put the first controller here and then I have basically okay same mapping for the authors or actually I'm going to return all the authors or I can ask author by ID, then I get return the single author. Then I have option to actually return all posts. Let me just put this up so you can see easily. Yeah, I can also filter by author ID. And there's also similar thing with the comments. So this one should be up and running now. So if we go, for example, let's say, okay, let's assume that we are now building a front end. So what we we do is first we'll probably ask, okay, give me all the posts, right? So that would be localhost, 8080, and posts. And then we get all the posts, right? And then maybe user click on the first post. Oh, this is this visible or not? Okay, for me it's not, but so. So then basically maybe user clicks on the first post, so it's three to one, right? And then we say, okay, let's, we want to show the author, how, what's the author of this post? So then we can say, okay, it's author is one, two, three, so we can say author, right, one, two, three, and we get the information about the author, but maybe you also want to show the comments, so we will go, okay, so give me the comments. Comments for the post three to one, and we get all the comments. So in order to show just one page, we're actually going to show the post and the author and the comments, we need to make multiple calls to the backend, right? So it's not really performant. So what every normal person would do then is basically look at, okay, the requests that are coming from the front end and optimize the back end, right? But again, like this is good enough that actually we can see, it, yeah, it, it, it can be like realistic enough. Okay, so now that we looked at REST, let's look what the GraphQL is. I'm not sure about you guys, but whenever I don't know something, what I do is basically I go on the internet and I try to search and find out what it is. I did the same thing for the GraphQL and what I found is official definition, which states GraphQL is a query language for APIs. Whatever that means. So I was probably like you guys, like what the hell? Yeah. So I continued reading and then basically I came with a more sane so answer to the question. And that is that GraphQL is a specification. Nothing more, nothing less. And this is very important for us to remember. Because we as developers, we will not be working with specifications. We are going to work with implementations of a specification. And in case of GraphQL, 
their implementations in JavaScript, Java, Go, PHP, and so on. Every single day there is a like new implementation of a GraphQL. Important thing about all those implementations is that not all of them covered whole specification. You know, some are like covered like small parts, some covered like big parts. Some of them maybe like, you know, didn't go according to specification. You know, if you remember Internet Explorer in the old days, you know, who cared about specification that time, right? So I'm going to use GraphQL Java implementation because I like Java the most. And again, like it always says, say talking is boring, let's look at the code. So the same URL, different branch. Okay, so I kill this one. Okay, let's just make this start up. Okay, so if we go and open the author now again, you can see it's exactly the same. So I haven't changed a line here. It's exactly the same as it was as I showed to you. If we go to author repository, again, exactly the same. I didn't change a single letter here. If I open post, again, exactly the same. If I open post repository, again, exactly the same. And this is one of the things which I really like about GraphQL. If you're starting a Greenfield project, you can use GraphQL. If you already have existing project and basically you just want to add GraphQL, it's very easy. You can basically reuse the whole backend without, very, without any problems. So the new things actually come here. So here we have a schema for a GraphQL. <coughs> and here basically I define all the types that I'm going to expose over the GraphQL API. In this case, I say, okay, I'm going to expose type author. And I have an ID, field ID of a type ID. This is a special type. It actually, it's a string, but it means it shouldn't be read, read by humans. So that's the whole point. Then we have exclamation mark here, which actually means this field is mandatory. So whenever somebody requests author, this field can't be null. It always has to be there. Then we have a field called name of a type string, name, and the fields are one-to-one, -one because in that way, GraphQL Java will know how to actually wire my types to my projects to my Java code. So that's a very important part. So if you go back to the schema, we have also comments. They're all exactly the same, like the, the pojo for the comments, so I'm not going to show that. And now we come to the heart of the GraphQL, because all of this above is basically just the types that we're exposing. However, here we actually defined how can user interact with our GraphQL API. So here we say, okay, we have a schema, and we have a query, which is of type query. Query is basically a special type, well, it should be, it's, it's read-only, so you can use whatever you want. You don't have to call it query. You can call it, you know, like, you know, Ukraine and whatever else. It's still going to work. But if you use a query, then everybody who looks at the GraphQL API will know, okay, this is read-only endpoint. So below here, we define a type. So it's, as you can see, exactly the same like all other types, but I'll show you the difference with this type. Here we have a field of all, all posts, and then basically we have array of posts. So let's look at actually now how we connect, basically how we wire our schema to the Java code. So first thing first, we need to go to our application, which is Spring Boot application, because again, I'm a lazy person. Below here, I'm going to actually uh, define servlet in a standard Spring Boot way, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. What is important is that on the endpoint slash GraphQL, I'm going to basically, you know, map the servlet. So any request going to slash GraphQL is going to go to my GraphQL API servlet. So let's look at that one. Here, again, I'm using the GraphQL Java and some other helper libraries because, like I said, I'm a lazy person, so I want for other people to do the most boilerplate code for me. So only thing that I need to do here for my GraphQL entry point is to extend simple GraphQL servlet and then in the constructor, basically provide the schema, and that's it. And the boilerplate code, everything will be done for me. So here what I need to do is basically, I say schema parser, new parser. I give the file of my schema. Then I do resolvers, I'll come back to this later. I do build and I make executable and that's it. And then basically GraphQL Java is going to actually look at my schema, look at my Java code and do the wiring automatically for me. So as if you remember, basically we had an author type, author pojo is going to connect them one-to-one -one because they're the same, they have the, all the same fields. The query 
it's going to say, okay, like I have no clue what to do with the query because we don't have a project query. So that's why then we have resolvers. So for those kind of things, we say, okay, like, okay, I'm going to help you. Here's the resolvers for you. And as you can see here, I have a basically query, which is exactly the same name, like here, query. Again, it's not a coincidence. This is to actually let GraphQL Java know how to wire one to one. So you need to use the same name. And that's why I said you can use whatever you want to use. It's still going to work if you use it in the both places. So if you go back, okay, so let's look at the query. So basically here, we have class query, which implements GraphQL query resolver, resolver, and that's it. Then we define basically one method here, which is called all posts, which return a list of posts. And if I go back here, no, not here, but if I go here, basically you can see here it's all posts, array of posts. So that's how it actually knows to connect one to one, because the field here is the method name, and that's it. Usually what the gra GraphQL Java does is if it sees a field, it tries to find getter or getter basically. If there is no getter, then it tries to basically find resolver which actually has a method with the same signature. Simple as that. Okay, this is up and running. So let's look at this now, how it looks like. So here I'm using the GraphQL, GraphQL, which is a JavaScript basically front end so that you can actually use in the playing and making sure that all is good. So I'll just clean this up. So what we can do is we can say, query, as you can see here, I have autocomplete, which is a very nice feature, right? I explained to you why it comes, from where it comes, and we have a title, we have a body, and we have author ID. And basically we can run it, and voila, we get all the, all the data, right, which is very nice. Additional thing which is also very nice, which we get for free, is documentation. So I just click here and have whole documentation. So I see here I have a query, if I type query, query is all posts which return the post, and I can see all the fields for the post. So this is for free, which is very nice. Another thing that I can actually also do is I can say, okay, I want to basically, I'm interested only in ID and a title. And it works out of the box, which is very nice. But first I saw this, I said, okay, let's be honest, this isn't really like groundbreaking, you know, filtering, it's not that difficult to do, I can do it myself. Documentation, while well, we have a swagger, you know, annotations, things like that, which actually can generate the documentation for me out of the box. So again, it's, it's nice, but nothing is still groundbreaking. But, you know, we'll look a little bit more into more this a little bit later. So first, let's see how actually GraphQL compares to the definition of the rest. Is it the client-server architecture? Well, I showed you the client and the server, right? So, yes. Is it statelessness? Well, I use this basically basic Java servlet with some code on top of it, so yes, it is, if I do it in the right way. Is it cacheable? Well, the answer is the same like the previous one. Layer system? Well, yeah. Code on demand? Well, it was optional anyway, so yes. Uniform interface? Well, I showed you the schema, right? So I would say also like a big yes. So without any problems, I could say that the GraphQL is a REST API. It's very advanced REST API, but it's REST API nevertheless. The first difference that we actually come here is basically here with the schema. So if we, as we all know, with the REST, schema is optional. You can actually have it or don't have it. You can actually write the code, generate the schema, or you can write the schema, then generate the code to actually map to it, or you can completely ignore it. It's a very good practice to have a schema, but if you don't have a schema, everything is still going to work. It's not the thing with the GraphQL. In a GraphQL, schema is mandatory. And this is like the big first difference between the REST, so it's traditional REST, and the GraphQL. Reason why schema is mandatory is very simple. First time basically when you have a client in your GraphQL API, the client is going to basically just go to the, to, to the API and say, okay, hi, you know, can you provide me with the schema? And the GraphQL is going to say, okay, here's my schema. This is how your request should look like. This is how my response will look like. Then what every normal client do is actually cache the schema and make sure that before it sends any request to the server, it validates according to the schema. Because what's the point of sending the request if you know right away that it's not going to be valid, right? What's the point? Again, if you're a naughty person and you actually force the client to send a request which is not valid, what's going to happen is basically the GraphQL API is going to look at your request it's going to validate it according to the schema and says, sorry, it's not valid. It's just going to throw away back the error. It's not going to do any kind of work. 
And this is a very nice feature which is like built into GraphQL, which means whenever a request actually comes to your code in a GraphQL, you, you can be 100% sure that it validated the schema and it's all correct. So you can actually do the work and do all, all the business logic. When we talk about advanced REST APIs, we have to talk about H2S. Self-exploratory and, exp and exploratory ex expandable, however, yeah, APIs, like I always forget the names. It's big ones. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, you know, if you think about it, it's, uh, if, if you think about your API as a website, when you go to the website, you don't really know anything about it. You just know the URL, right? But you go there, then there's like articles, links, and whatever, and you can actually follow the information of the data that you want to do. With H2S, it is the same thing with the REST API. Basically, you have a link to actually follow the next information and the next information and things like that. So this is exactly what I thought when I said that the GraphQL is a very advanced API, REST API. Again, let's look at the code. So if we just go here, okay, let's start this one. <coughs> so I have only one small change here. So I opened basically my schema. In schema, I have this field created by, and it returns the type of the author. So that's the only change that I have in the schema. So let's see if this one is up and running. Okay, so this is up and running. So now what I need to do is refresh basically the page so that GraphQL gets the new schema. So it gets the new schema now, and now I can say, okay, created by, and I can say name. And it works. So basically I got this. So let's look how actually I made this work. So if I go here, if I go to the post, no changes here. So there's still author ID there. Okay, if we open post repository, again, no changes here. So it's still exactly the same. If we go to the my GraphQL entry point, basically to my servlet, you will see one change here. And that is I added new resolver, post resolver. So let's look what actually that post resolver does. So post resolver, implements GraphQL resolver. So if we compare to the query here, basically we implement GraphQL query resolver. While in the post resolver, I implement GraphQL resolver and I provide type post. This actually says to the GraphQL Java, whenever you have a field in a post that you don't know how to resolve, so there is not a getter for it, basically look here. It should be here. and as you can see here, I have a field here called created by, which takes a post as an argument and return the author. And that is basically how my Java code and GraphQL Java code knows how to actually wire and basically resolve the dependency. So whenever I actually ask for some post and I say, okay, give me the field created by, it's going to come here and say, okay, resolve this field basically created by for this post. That's it, very simple. So what we had basically before, before was something like this. We had three types, post, author, and comment, and basically we had a connection from the client to the post, right? And that was it. Then I added link between post and the author. So that's why I can actually ask for, for information about the author. But why stop here, right? So let's go from the author to the post, from the post to the comment, from the comment to the post, and then from the comment to the author, right? So now we have like a very nice graph. Now you know why it's called GraphQL. So again, talking is boring, let's look at the code. Okay, so let's look at this one. So if we go back to schema. <coughs> so now we have a little bit more changes. So now we have basically connected everything to everything almost. So we have type author, and we, it has field posts, array of posts. In post we also have a field comments which is array of comments. In a comment, we have created by, which is an author. And in a comment, we have belongs to, which is a post. And that's it. So if we go back to our GraphQL entry point, basically you're going to see now we have some additional resolvers. So we have now author resolver, we have comment resolver, and we also changed a little bit post resolver because now post has additional field. 
So in the post we already had created by, but now we also have a field comments, which takes post and return list of comments. And if we go to author resolver, yes, resolver, again, auto resolver implements GraphQL resolver for the type author. And basically, there is a field, actual method called posts. Is it visible for the back or not? Better now? Okay. Just yell if, if you don't see something or if I'm going too fast, just yell. I'm here for you. So it's the worst thing that I can do is basically I just talk, 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 and you go outside and say, like, what the hell? So we have a field method posts, which return author, actually takes the author, and return list of posts. And if we go for to the comments, resolver, It's the same thing. We have basic comment resolver, which takes implements GraphQL resolver for the type comments. Okay, so this one is up and running. So let's actually now play a little bit with this. Let's see what we can get now. So what we can have now is okay, we have the post, right? So let's say I want to get comments, and I can get text, right? But the comments also has who created it, so we can say created by. And we can say name, right? But then also this is the author, and the author has the post. So we can say posts. Okay, go away. And we can say title. And I can actually continue like this however I want. So basically we can create now very, very complex queries. So I would say now that you know we kind of realize that actually this is kind of very powerful. So I think that now, if I show you this definition again to you, that GraphQL is a query language for APIs, now it makes sense, right? Yeah. So this is basically the original idea how the GraphQL was envisioned to be used. Basically, you have a client on one side, then you put a GraphQL API, and then you put a lot of backend systems on the other side. And all of them basically expose some types through the GraphQL and through the GraphQL API, basically because GraphQL API is very powerful. Query language is a very powerful one. I didn't show you all the possibilities of it. I also didn't show you all the possibilities of the schema. There are very much there are much more things there that I, I just don't have time to show. So this is again big difference between the REST and the GraphQL. In GraphQL, we have a very powerful query language. And that's a good thing, but also it's a bad thing. Because in traditional REST, basically we know exactly how the user is going to interact with our application because we defined all the endpoints and everything. With the GraphQL, basically we just say, okay, this is the types that we have, this is the connections between them, go, you know, go just ask what you want. So it's a, there's a lot of power at the fingertips at the, our users. And that's something that you always need to keep in the back of your mind. Because basically, with the GraphQL, client calls the shots. Like I said, in REST, I will define the endpoints. I will define everything and I will know when you call one endpoint, what you can get and where that's going to end up in my code. With the GraphQL, I have no clue. You can go from any single point of view, especially if we have very complex graphs. And this is very important to remember because, for example, here, this is a very simple example, right? But this example has a big flaw, very big flaw, a very serious flaw. And that is here, I have circle dependency, which means that if I go back here to my code, so I can see I have like comments, text, right, posts. Again, I can ask again for comments. And I can say text, right? But then I can also again say created by. And I can say name, right? And then I can say posts. And I can continue creating this query as long as I want because there is cycle dependency, which means that, you know, code which I'm showing to you, which is of course not production ready, at one point it's just going to explode. So, yeah, so this is basically what I said. So, somebody can actually create a query like this by mistake or on purpose. So there is very easy to abuse GraphQL API, especially if you're not aware of it. So how do we actually protect ourselves from that? Well, here actually what the beginning of, of the talk comes in place. I told you we're dealing with implementations. Some implementations have some protections built into it, some are not. If there is no protection built in implementation that you're using, then you have to build it. 
So the simplest thing that you can do is do just the timeout. Basically, the client sends request to you, you say, okay, like, sorry, like it's taking just too long, I'm just going to kill it. But this isn't really going to protect you because in the back end, your system is still like burning the CPU, still burning the memory, the network and everything. So this is the easiest thing to implement, but it's like least effective. The better thing that what you can do is actually check the max query depth. As I said, when somebody sends request to you, basically your GraphQL API takes the request, validates it according to the scheme and say, okay, is it valid or not? During that validation, you can also check, okay, how deep the query is. If it's uh, above some number, you just say, sorry, too expensive, I'm not going to do it. It's more difficult to implement than to time out, but it's also more effective. However, it will not protect you if somebody attacks in, in, in the width. You know, if it's like depth protection, but not the width protection. So in that case, what you can do is actually do max query complexity. So you can say for every single query that user can do, you score it and you give some score. And then basically again, when you do the validation of the whole query, you sum all the numbers. And if the number is just too big, you say, sorry, it's just too complex for me. You know, I can't do it. You know, it's going to kill me. It's more complex to implement and it's also more complex to actually maintain. Because if you write the code and query today, you might know what the complexity is. You might know what all the things are basically happening in the backend system. If six months from now, somebody else comes and some change some code, will they know that they need to also update the query the basically complexity? Will they know how to actually do the right scoring? So it's a more tricky thing to do. But again, it's better protection. The best possible protection, but most tricky to implement is just do the throttling. Basically, Every number of cycles, you'd give a certain amount of memory and CPU to certain requests, and that's it. And then if somebody is creating crazy requests, they're just going to wake you up until the end of the time. Again, depending on the implementation you're using, maybe some of these things are already done for you, maybe they left the hooks for you. It all depends. So, as we said, GraphQL is a query language for APIs. It actually consists of the three big parts. First part is a query, and I think we showed it in, I showed it in like more than enough details. It's read-only, it doesn't change the data, it's going to be run in, by default in parallel, because it shouldn't be changing the data. Then we have a mutation, of course, to change the data, because if the only thing you can do is read the data, it's going to stop being interesting very fast, right? Mutation, because you're changing the data, is done in sequence. So let's look at that in the in example. Oops, I forgot to kill this one. Yeah, I forgot to kill this one, so now we have to wait a little bit. Okay. And basically added one more type mutation. Let me just this up so you can actually see. Which is add author. Here's basically how you provide with the parameters. I can use also the same thing in a query to actually just send the parameters to the query. In this case, of course, I need, because I'm adding the author, I need a name, so it's basically parameter name of a type string. Am I returning back the author? And also I'm removing the author. So again, we add the resolver in a GraphQL entry point. So here, basically we added mutation. Again, the same name like in the schema. And if we open it, we'll see let me just put this up so you see better. We have a mutation which implements GraphQL mutation resolver. So if you go to the query quickly, in case of the query, it's a query resolver. Well, in case mutation, it's mutation resolver. Again, we have a method for every field that we had in a schema. We have an add author, string, basically name of type string, and we're going to return the author, and we also can remove the author. So is this up and running? Yes. So let me show you quickly, because I'm slowly running out of time. Okay, so let's first thing, first let's see all the authors, okay? So I added all, aut no, all authors. So I just see name, right? So that you can see that I'm not cheating. So here the, oops, okay, no problem. So we have all the authors. So now let's see add mutation, add author, 
Okay, name, let's see. Here, this called right here, right? Oops. And then we see ID and name. And we have here. That's it, it works. So, that's mutation. Then we have the third part, which is called subscription. Actually, let me then kill this one. And this one was recently introduced into Java world, so to say. It was beginning, from the, from the old times it was in JavaScript, but in Java it was recent, like a few months ago. Basically, it, it means that, you know, it's similar to the, to the query. It's read-only, but in the subscription part, you basically send a query, and you get the feed of the data. So you're constantly getting the stream of the data back. So let's look at actually how it, that one looks. So this is, the, this is the only one on a different URL, and I added this this morning, so sorry for not making it too fancy. Uh, so I need to, I need to also, I need to go to a different project. Okay, where is that? Just this one. Okay, so in this case, this is my schema. And here again, in the, in the heart of the GraphQL, I define just this, subscription, subscription. Then I put type subscription. I have a field called data, which returns hello. And hello is a type which I define here, which has only one field called message of a type string. So in this example, I'm really like embraced all the magic of a Spring Boot, so I don't really need to create resolvers and schemas. I actually need to create resolvers, but I don't need to create schema. So in this case, only thing that I actually need to do is for any type of resolver, I just add here, add component, and that's it. And then the Spring magic will pick up everything else. So in this case, I have a subscription, which implements GraphQL subscription resolver, again, so it knows it's subscription. Here I defined the method called the data, and just look here, it's, I'm not returning the hello, I'm returning the publisher of hello. So in this case, I'm using Rx Java to actually you know, create the constant stream of the data to the front end. So here I'm just actually using, creating observable of a type hello, and I'm just using scheduler to actually schedule at a fixed rate. And what I'm going to do is every two seconds, so every two seconds, I'm going to create hello. I'm going to set message hello with a timestamp, and that's it, and send it. Then here, basically from observable, I'm creating connection observable so that actually I can connect to it and I can actually start sending the data. And then from that one, I'm going to create flowable so that actually I can put a back pressure so that I don't know that I don't kill anybody. So this one is up and running, so if we... Uh, now, just need to go to a different endpoint. Co host, yeah. This one. And now, I say subscription, say data, say message. And now we wait just a few seconds. And now you see that the, the it's changing time. So every two seconds, I'm getting a new message. Uh, from the client side, is going to actually open the web socket to my GraphQL API and basically just you know, pull the data and, and get the data all the time. Okay, so let me kill this one. Let me start this one. Okay, so there are some questions that you might ask yourself, you know, when it comes to the GraphQL. The first question, which is a very important question, is okay, but what do we do with errors? What do we do with our responses? Because so far I only showed you the happy path, right? Everything worked. And of course, it was all the demos, so of course everything is going to work, right? What's the point of demos anyway? So the good thing about GraphQL and the fact that it's a specification is that, you know, all these kind of things already were taken care of for you. You don't have to think about it. So if I just go back here, let's first, okay, refresh this one. So if I go here and say query, right? And say, okay, let's say all post and let's say something that they know there is no there so in the old post there is not there is this field doesn't exist I call it 
Then look what I get. Here is basically data is null. I'm not sure if you made, if you took the notes or not, but until now, every time the data, the response was in slash data. Now the data is null, and we have a new field which is called errors, and basically here is a message about the error. This is just out of the box error that you get from the GraphQL Java implementation. You can actually customize it and make you know, changes according as you want. But again, the good thing is, okay, if there is data, it's going to be in the data. If there is an error, data is going to be null, and the error is going to actually contain the error that you get. So that's a very nice thing already taken care of for you. The second thing that you can ask yourself, okay, what do we do with performance and caching? Again, like the code which I showed to you is going to be very, very talkative. It's going to be very low performance. Because in my case, if I have a post, actually if I have an author, and the author created 100 posts, and I say, okay, give me the post and then give me the author, and give me the post, give me the author. Actually, it's going to say for every post, it's going to call me the same author, so it's going to say call same author to the database 100 times. That's very bad performance. So that's another thing that you need to think about with the GraphQL because you don't know really how the user is going to come to you, so you need to think, okay, how can actually I make sure that my performance is good? The good thing is that, you know, in the case of a GraphQL, actually a lot of things you can do like that we're doing right now. So what usually we do, we don't go from the controller directly to the database, right? We go to the service. So for example, like here. So if you just do that from a resolver, go to the service, and then basically just add here cacheable, you know how to type? Yeah, cacheable. That's it. All is going to be cached. So again, you just need to think a little bit out of the box, and a lot of old tricks that you already know and use, you can reuse very easily, but you need to be aware of them. Again, GraphQL as a GraphQL doesn't really care about performance and cache on its own. So it's maybe some implementation that you're using is going to think about it, but majority of the implementation is just going to take the GraphQL schema and wire it to your Java code, and that's it, to resolvers. Everything else is up to you. What do we do with authentication and authorization? Well, similar thing. Again, majority of the GraphQL Java implementations don't really care about it. They think, okay, that's your work. You need to do about it. Some of them basically already implemented some stuff for you. Some of them left the hooks for you. So for example, in the GraphQL Java implementation, it's not, last time I checked it wasn't done. Maybe it's done now. They're very fast, so who knows. But they left the hooks. So the approach is very simple. First, you create your class, some con for example, my context. And you extend GraphQL context. And then you add some custom stuff there that you want to have. Then you go basically to your servlet, GraphQL entry point, which extends, like, of course, like simple GraphQL servlet, so no changes here. And you just add here. Override, can maybe, uh, do you see this part or not? Let me, let me move it. Is it better now? Yep. So, okay, so basically you just override, where the hell am I? Yeah, so you just override the method called create context, and as you can see, it takes two parameters, optional request and optional response. You return GraphQL context, and basically in the body, you do whatever you want to do. Basically, you create your own custom context and you, from the request response, from the headers or wherever, you basically take like authorization ID, some cookies, whatever. But basically, you build your own custom context that you're going to use later. Then, you basically go where you're actually going to use it. So I can go back. It's visible now, right? Oh, actually, no, let's go back. It's easier like this. So basically, you go to your, for example, query implementation. which implements GraphQL Query Resolver. So again, no changes here. We just go into method that you want to actually extend with authorization or authentication. You add one parameter called data fetching environment, and then basically you just say environment get context, and you're going to get the context. And then you can do whatever you want to do. So last time I checked, it wasn't implemented. Maybe it was, maybe now it is, because they're really moving fast. But again, if it's not implemented, Usually there are hooks for you that you can actually use to do whatever you want to do. So let's summarize quickly GraphQL versus traditional REST API. First of all, as you saw, they're very similar. They're very similar and basically GraphQL is a very advanced REST API. 
uh, tools and knowledges for the rest let's be honest it's much much better than for graphql and that's no re and there's a simple reason for that rest is with us long before the roy feeling actually created doctor dissertation so like amount of knowledge that people have and the tools and the frameworks everything is huge graphql is still kind of new kid on the block but it's really you know picking up the speed very very fast for example, in March, subscription wasn't present in the Java implementation. Then in June, I gave a talk and I looked at the, at the graphical Java and said, oh, there is a subscription. I need to implement also that to add this to the talk. So they're really moving very fast and adding new features constantly. And really became the speed very, very good. Like I said, a lot of old tricks can actually work from the REST world into GraphQL world. Again, you need sometimes to tweak it a little bit, to think a little bit out of the box. But again, you know, with just a little bit of ingenuity, a lot of old tricks can be reused and improve the quality and performance of your code. GraphQL has extremely rich SDL. I didn't show you like not even like uh, the half of it. There's like conditionals, basically. They're like, you can actually extend the renames, the, the fields. Like you can do crazy stuff in it. So I really like you know, urge you go and just check it. There's a lot of good stuff there. Also. Oh yeah, SDL, yeah, that's the SDL, my bad. I was talking about the graphical query language. But SDL is also extremely powerful. I also didn't show you all the kind of things. One thing that killed me, for example, is when I had like to create a REST API and I needed, of course, I need resources, but then I had one entry point where I need to like combine all the resources that I can send. And then, okay, how do I define it in the Swagger? How do I define it in like open API spec in RAML? It's not a very easy thing. In, in GraphQL, you have unions, you have interfaces, you have also very, all kind of stuff that actually really helps you create very much nice schemas, very powerful schemas, and also very powerful query language. Thank you. <laughs> this is the resources actually that I used throughout the code. So you're like, here's all the basically the demos and everything. So you can go and check them out. Any questions? Uh, again, like you, you can send the error yourself. So the question is, okay, like I showed you, if, if the user send a bad request, right? And the co and what you do if you basically if there is a business error? Again, it's a very similar thing. You can just you know throw the error back. There's again like it, it's just you know uh, I forgot on the top of my head. Basically, you need to extend just some class from GraphQL ex exceptions, and basically you just throw it, and it's going to happen. Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, for the syntax errors, can you override the messages? Yes, you can customize the errors and exceptions and everything as much as you want. You can go nuts with it. I just, I was like bored, so I actually didn't have time to go into that one, but it's very easy to just extend it, add the values, extend it, localize it, do whatever you want to do. Any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um. Does Graph, uh, GraphQL is more suitable for client-to-server communication or between servers also for microservices architecture? Uh, okay, so your question is like, is it only for client-server or it also can be like from the server to the server? Yeah, yeah. Well, basically it can do for, for in any way that you want because I showed you like JavaScript front-end client because it's the easiest thing for me to, to demo. But there are like, uh, there are basically the Java clients, there are like Android clients, there are basic clients in Go, in PHP, so you can actually connect two services also without any problems. So there's even like an option that you can actually have like multiple GraphQL APIs, and then you put one GraphQL on top of it, then it actually does like the stitching of all those GraphQL APIs and basically create like one crazy GraphQL API. I know that it's called uh, GraphQL stitching, I know that it's implemented in JavaScript, and I know that they're working on it in a Java. I'm not sure at which stage they are. Does it answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Because he, he asked before. Sorry, he already raised his hand before. Uh, and is it possible to combine uh, several REST APIs from different hosts? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's very easy actually. Like like I said. I think I even have a slide for that one. Basically, that was the original idea with, uh, behind the GraphQL, that basically you put the GraphQL like an entry point for your clients. Where is the thing? Yeah. And basically then here in, in, in the back end, you can have like all kinds of stuff. So you can have like REST APIs, you have databases, you have other GraphQL APIs, you can have whatever you want. So that was the original idea of the GraphQL. 
because it has a very powerful query language, it has very powerful schema, so you can actually define all the types and connections between them in a very easy way and like really give a lot of power to the users. I'm not sure to follow you. Uh, I'm to really follow your yeah, question. So you want to send? To, to make an order, you just okay. uh, send an uh, entity ID to the seller and uh, just uh, do some stuff without the sponsor, just to create the sponsor. How, how this system works? Well, is this immutable? Or well, in that, I'm not really sure, first of all, like, okay, so your, your idea is, okay, you just uh, want to, go, for example, create an order, and you set an ID of the order, something like that, and to change something, you don't get the response back. So that's your question, right? I think in basically like off the top of my hand that it would go into mutation, but it doesn't really, I think, feel naturally into GraphQL, so maybe like we can just talk afterwards in, in more detail. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, for instance, when I, um, when you retrieve the uh, names of all, uh, all... Yeah, by the way, don't forget to vote. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. For instance, you retrieve the names of uh, all authors. Yes. And uh, at this time, your application uh, actually retrieves the whole entity of authors and then uh, filter and send the response back to the client on application side. Okay. Okay. Can I, through the GraveQL, uh, propagate which fields I'm actually interested in and uh, create my queries to the, for instance, database? Uh, so I can retrieve only few. I, I answer. So you don't want to basically fetch the. So the idea is basically, in my case, I'm fetching all the data, and then I'm doing the filtering for the fields. And you would like to basically to optimize basically the call to to the GraphQL. On top of my hand, the only thing that I can think of is that it's not really idea of how the GraphQL works, but you can probably hack it, or maybe there's find some hooks that actually in a part where actually does the, so to say, validation of the query and preparing of everything that actually do the optimization there, but out of the box that I know it's it's not really like you know straightforward thing yeah because in theory it doesn't know if then it's going to the database or other API so that's why you know some it's more tricky yeah. uh, the question is about aggregations how GraphQL works with it I uh, mean for example if I want to return map uh, author and the list of his posts how we can resolve it well basically like it's not really aggregation, so the, the GraphQL does have a nice API, but it's not like SQL, so you can't do like grouping, things like that. But you can say, like, in my case, all authors, and then basically you need to create posts, right? What? What, what I have here? All authors? Mm. Just a second, I, I look like I killed my GraphQL endpoint. It's not that really like you can't do the grouping like an SQL. So that part you can't do if you want to do that. But you can actually create the connection between the okay the all authors. So it was here. So basically you can create all authors and then basically you can say posts. Yes. Yeah, so and then so you can have something like this. So you can do something like this that you can actually say okay from this for this author give me all the posts, but then this needs to be defined in a graphical schema. So GraphQL can't do like grouping and having that we know from the SQL. So that part is not present, but a lot of other stuff is present. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Are we out of the time or we have some Can I avoid uh, writing schema by hands? I mean, can I get it generated in runtime using J uh, uh, Java? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, there's basically, let me just type it because I always pronounce it wrong. So there's SPQR. I know for this implementation. So there's like SPQR, which actually does exactly the same thing. You, you generate the code, you put annotations, and then it actually creates the schema for you. Uh, there's definitely some more implementations, but I know this one by hand. Uh, do we still have time or no? OK, one more question then. Uh, so you want to basically have like 
I'm not sure if I follow you. So basically, you have like in database one thing, but you want to get at the end. Of the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can without any problem. So the only thing that you need to know is basically when you define the. Okay, so the only thing that you need to hear basically is okay. Here I have a type. No, let's go to some. So this type, basically, what fields are here, and that's it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same in the database. So for example, here I can have like, say, like say, date, date, or like I say, like you know, like I don't know, like my field, my type, something like that, which doesn't exist. And this doesn't exist in the database. But again, like, then you need to do it in Resolver. So basically, because then it's going to say, okay, like, how do you actually create this type? And then Resolver is going to say, okay, this is how I build it. And then you can do transformations and all those kind of things. Uh, yeah, uh, one more, and then, like, we have to go. Yes? A pagination, uh, that's a very easy one. Uh, basically, I sh show you this one, right? So this is how, in mutation, you set the parameters. This is how you can actually send parameters also in the query. So in a query, basically, you can say here, okay, page and then, ah. okay, I don't know how to type, my problem. And basically, you put here, integer. I think it's integer or whatever. And that's it. And then basically, you're going to send to your resolver, okay, this is the parameter, and then you need to do, in resolver, you need to do pagination, sizing, and all those kind of things. So the GraphQL doesn't do it for you automatically, but you just send the parameter, and then you can do the filtering, the pagination, do, you can do whatever you want to do. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we're out of time, so if you have any questions, just come to me after the talk, or ping me online. Thank you very much for your great audience, and don't forget to vote.